Shalom, blessed morning, happy Chinese New Year. Jonghi Huat Chai. All is well. I pray that uh, this year, that in Christ uh, we will all be well. As uh, oh, did I put it? As uh, Pastor Elvin has mentioned, today we begin uh, a new preaching series uh, on the book of James, and this will take us all the way into the month of July. And I've entitled this entire James preaching series as True Faith. And if we look at the book of James, there are actually two words that are very important. The first word is true or genuineness, and the second word is perfect or made complete. Last Saturday, I was uh, delighted to be able to watch this old, old favorite. Uh, how many of you have seen this movie? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, to the young ones, you should watch this movie, okay? Uh, if you think the actors of today are good, then the actors of those days, yeah, they're really superior. In case you've never watched this movie, uh, this is a uh, beloved musical. Uh, about a woman, a cockney working class flower girl from Covent Garden in England uh, by the name of Eliza Doolittle, who went to a phonetics professor by the name of Professor Henry Higgins because she wanted to take elocution lessons so that it would improve her chance of getting a job as an assistant in a florist shop. That was what she wanted, you know, to improve her job prospects. But the pompous professor, he was sure of his ability to transform this uh, lady, this working class Cockney lady, that he wagered with his uh, fellow linguist by the name of Colonel Pickering, that in six months, six months by teaching her to speak properly, the Queen's English, he will enable her to pass as a lady, to become a cultured member of high society. Our theme for 2022 is becoming, as Pastor Alvin had uh, uh, informed us uh, during his Vision Sunday message. And the goal of becoming is not that we can pass for a Christian. The goal of becoming is not that we learn Christian speak. We learn to speak like a Christian so that we can pass as a Christian. The goal of becoming is much deeper than that. It is transformation. And I think the best word as Paul used in Romans chapter 12 is this word transformation, or in Greek, the word metamorphosis, which uh, refers to a change, a complete change of the nature of a person into a completely different one. It's not the form, but it's the heart. And just like the adult butterfly, the adult butterfly is, you know, does not in any way resemble the egg, the lava, or the pupa, completely different, completely transformed. And of course, just now Pastor Elvin mentioned uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul said that whoever is in Christ is a new creation. A new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So it's... Uh, about complete transformation so that the person you become is totally different from the person you used to be. And what is this new creation like? What does it look like? Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, he said, the second part, he said, that you might become mature. You might become mature. You need to grow. As a new creation, you need to grow attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. 
the full measure, not half measure, not 30%, not 70%, not 80%, but the full measure of the fullness of Christ. It is becoming like Christ, becoming like Jesus in every way. It means uh, a transformation of our mind. It means a transformation and overhaul of our value system. It means developing a spiritual, a Christian, a biblical philosophy of life. And the epistle of James is very much, uh, it's very relevant to this theme of becoming. You know, James, the writer of this epistle, he is not interested He's not interested to hear that, to hear your profession of faith. He's not interested to hear you saying, I'm a Christian. He's not interested to hear you say that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm a disciple. He's not interested in that. Rather, he is most interested in the practice of faith. Not profession, but the practice of faith. And so, if you look through the five chapters of this epistle, you will notice that there's very little emphasis on the fundamentals of faith, on the doctrines of faith. Because James is not interested in the roots, the fundamentals of the Christian faith. Rather, he is interested in the fruits. Not the roots, but the fruits of faith. How to grow, how to advance, how to mature, how to be transformed in the way of holiness, in the way of Christ-likeness as a new creation in Christ. I'd like to quote Pastor Stephen J. Cole. This is uh, his comment about um, this epistle. This is what he said. Several writers refer to James as the least theological epistle in the New Testament except for Philemon. It's not that James discounts the importance of sound doctrine, but rather that he wants to see that doctrine affecting how we live. Let me say that again. He wants to see that sound doctrine affecting how we live. James says, talk is cheap. James wants to see results. Of the 108 verses in the book, 54 or half contain imperative verbs, command words. James is like a crusty sergeant barking orders at the troops. He wants to see some action. Don't talk. Don't tell me about faith, show me. And going back to my fair lady, you know, um, I remember songs like Get Me to the Church on Time, or I Could Have Danced All Night, you know, or The Rain in Spain. But when I watched it last Saturday, I was, uh, uh, I I learned this song that Eliza Doolittle sang. And the title of the song is Show Me show me. There was a young man who was vying for her affection. And this was what she said to him, show me. So let me read to you some of the words of this song. Words, words, words. I'm so sick of words. I get words all day through, first from him, now from you. Is that all you blighters can do? Don't talk of stars burning above. If you're in love, Show me. Sing me no song, read me no rhyme. Don't waste my time, show me. Don't talk of June, don't talk of of fall. Don't talk at all, show me. Talk is cheap, James says, show me. And what James is driving through in this epistle is this, true faith True faith shows itself. 
True faith shows itself in what way? In practical, godly living. Two very key verses from James chapter 2. James says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? And in verse 17, he says, Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And in James chapter 2, verse 22, James seems to be making this point. He says that actions, our actions, that accompany our faith, our actions, make our faith complete. Our actions perfect our faith. And he, he refers to Abraham. Verse 22, James 2, you see that his faith, Abraham's faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete or perfect by what he did. Faith and actions must go together. That's the point. But before we dive into James, let's take a look at the author. Who is James? There are a number of James in the New Testament. The first one is uh, James, the son of Zebedee or the brother of jo and the brother of John. The second one is James, the son of Alphaeus. But most, most Bible scholars believe that this James is the half-brother of Jesus. They believe that it is actually the brother, the half-brother of Jesus. And the interesting thing is this. James and his other brothers, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, they did not believe Jesus during his earthly ministry. Although Jesus was going around preaching and teaching and doing great works, healing people, uh, doing acts of miracles, none of his brothers believed him. Acts 8, uh, sorry, where am I? John 7, verse 5, for even his own brothers did not believe him. But then something happened that caused him to move from unbelief to belief, to faith. And what was it? And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7, after the resurrection of Christ, Christ appeared to him. In 1 Corinthians 15, 7, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. I want you to think, you know, all this while, you don't believe in him. He didn't believe in Jesus. Although he saw his works, he heard his teachings, he didn't believe him. And when he saw his half-brother crucified on the cross and then dying, he thought that was the end of his brother. But then, Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to him. That changed him. That encounter transformed him. That encounter convinced him that Jesus truly was the Messiah. And he, in turn, began to share this knowledge about Jesus to the other brothers. You see, James underwent spiritual transformation. He became a true believer. He not only believed, subsequently he became a leader a leader of the church in Jerusalem. And Paul described him along with uh, Cephas and John as a pillar, a pillar of the church in Jerusalem. He also came to be known as James the Just or James the Righteous because he was well known for his holiness, for his righteous living. And it was said that, you know, his, his knees were as hard as a camel's because he was always on his knees and always praying. You know, my brothers and sisters, James is most qualified to talk to us about becoming. He is the best person to talk to us about transformation, about real life change because his life showed that, his life demonstrated that 
His life was a demonstration of practical, godly living. His faith was evidenced by fruits. But there's one other thing I want us to notice about James, and that is his humility. Look at how he described himself. In James 1 verse 1, he said, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the NKJV and NASB, he describes himself as a born servant. Not just servant, but a born servant. You know, James did not pull rank. He did not drop names. He did not introduce himself as James, the son of the Virgin Mary the brother of Jesus who was resurrected from the dead. I knew him. We grew up together. I knew him before he became famous. He did not drop names. He simply wanted to be known as a servant. What does it mean to be a born servant? It simply means to be a slave. He referred to himself as one who is the property, the property of the Lord Jesus Christ. One who lives to do the biddings of his master, the Lord Jesus Christ. He acknowledges this, I have no rights because I'm a born servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wrote this epistle, to the Jews who were not living in Israel, but to the Jews who were scattered everywhere, who were living outside of Israel. And in James 1 verse 1, we read that, you know, uh, he sent this letter with greetings to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. And why were they scattered? Because of persecution. They had been scattered because of persecution. So he was writing to people who were experiencing trials, who were undergoing suffering for their faith. Okay, remember, they were experiencing trials because of their faith. As Jews, because they were living outside of Israel, because they were living in Gentile lands, they became the victims of anti-Semitism. And even living with other Jews, they were rejected because they were followers of the way, followers of Jesus. And we read James, there were other issues as well. There was the problem of temptation, temptation to sin, the practice of favoritism. There was unhealthy competition. People in the church wanted to become teachers and preachers. James said, be careful that you don't wish to be a teacher. He was also dealing with the problem of worldliness and tongue. The tongue was also a serious problem. The tongue was causing disunity. It was creating wars and divisions in the church. And a lot of people were lapsing into superficial, formal religion. Superficial, formal religion that professed faith, that professed belief, fundamental beliefs, but in reality, practicing selfish and ungodly lifestyles. And these are the same problems the 21st century church is facing. Is worldliness a problem? Is superficial faith a problem? Is the tongue a problem in the church? Do we still have gossip and slander in the church? That is why this epistle is very, very relevant to us today. And so James writes this epistle to the scattered Jewish believers to make this point. True faith. If you say you have true faith, show me. Because true faith will show itself in practical, godly living. If there is no such evidence, if you cannot see it, then the genuineness of your faith is questionable. 
And what is the evidence of true faith? Okay, let me just go through this very quickly. In the five chapters, James says in chapter 1, true faith responds with joy and godliness under testing. Chapter 2, true faith reveals itself in practical obedience. Chapter 3, true faith controls the tongue and acts with gentle wisdom. Chapter 4, true faith resists arrogance by humbling himself, humbling oneself before God. And in chapter 5, true faith practices biblical love by seeking to restore those who have strayed from the truth. And so what I'm going to do is, going to go, I'm going to go through the five chapters, okay? <laughs> I hope I don't take too long, uh, all right? But I want to present to you the highlights of these five chapters. Go through all these five ways in which true faith reveals itself. First, let's look at how true faith responds with joy and godliness under testing. You know, James says you will face two kinds of testing. The first kind is from the outside, and this refers to trials, trials that come on the outside. And James says this, true faith responds with joy. True faith responds with joy in times of testing. Let there be joy in the heart of the hurting. He said this, consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, James does not say, he does not only say joy, he says pure joy, unadulterated joy. And we all know that, you know, when we face trials, to respond with joy is a response that is counterintuitive. It is not natural for us to respond with joy. Very difficult in the flesh. But James says, focus on the end. Focus on why you are undergoing trials. Because James says, trials produce perseverance or stamina and he says when perseverance has finished its work the one who has undergone trial will be perfect or mature and complete not lacking anything and it is very important that we note that James is specifically referring to trials that come because of our faith not because of our foolishness Trials that come because we are Christians. We call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ. And James says, you can consider it joy because I want you to have this perspective that your trials are not your enemies. They are not your foes. They are your friends. They are God-ordained trials and testings to achieve God's higher purpose. And what is that of growing, of maturing us so that we might become spiritually complete and perfect? You know, that's the truth here. If we want to grow, then we must be willing to undergo trials. We cannot stretch ourselves spiritually we cannot develop spiritual muscles unless our faith is under duress. We cannot. It is a spiritual principle. The writer of Hebrews says that we are tested, we undergo trials so that we might share in God's holiness, becoming, becoming holy like God, just as God is holy, and that we might reap a harvest of righteousness and peace. But James did not stop there, you know. He subsequently tells his listeners how they can persevere. How can you tahan when you're undergoing trials? 
in order for us to be able to persevere so that uh, the perseverance can finish its work, James says you need wisdom. You need wisdom from God. True faith not only responds with joy during times of testing, true faith seeks God's wisdom in times of testing. You need God's wisdom to make sense of what's happening to you. You need God's wisdom to understand the purpose of the trials and testings that you're going through. You need God's wisdom. You need God's perspective. So James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So in a nutshell, what James is saying, you need God's wisdom in order not to waste. You need God's wisdom in order not to waste the opportunities that God is giving you to mature. If you do not have God's wisdom, they will all be wasted. Wisdom helps us to understand how God uses adverse circumstances for our good and for His glory. For our good and for His glory. But that's the second type of testing. And this refers to testings that come from the inside. And this refers to temptations. James says, true faith perseveres under testing, not blaming, blaming God for temptations. Verse 13, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Sometimes trials are testings on the outside. Sometimes they are temptations on the inside. But that's a difference. Trials are tests either sent or allowed by God, but temptations come from Satan. They are sent by Satan. And the problem is this, because of our fallen nature, we encourage ourselves to fall into temptation. But the danger is this, when we are tempted, we can find ourselves complaining, grumbling to God, questioning His love, and resisting His will. James says this, when you are tempted, there are two things you need to recognize. First, you need to recognize the source of temptation. The source of temptation is not God. God does not tempt you. The source is, surprisingly, what? Our own selfish desires. What does verse 14 say? But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Ever since Eve, we are very good at blaming people. Your fault lah. Why did I commit adultery? Because of the woman lah, the way she was dressed. The source is inside. Not anything external, it's inside. And then very importantly, James says also recognize the cause. Temptation has a cause. Temptation is like a highway. James shows that sin and temptation is not stationary. It follows a cause. A steady cause towards an ultimate end. And what is that? Death. After desire has Conceived, it gives birth to sin, and, when, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And so it's very important to note this distinction that James is making. James describes two totally different destinies. In James 1.15, James says, one destiny that you can reap is death. 
But there's another destiny that can be yours, found in James 1 verse 12. James says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. You can choose death by following temptation to the end, or you can choose life by persevering and letting perseverance finish its work. You will receive the crown of life. And then as he moves to chapter 2, James says, true faith reveals itself in practical obedience. In the first seven verses, James says, true faith does not show favoritism. There was a problem in the early church, the problem of favoritism, the problem of unequal treatment being given to the rich and to the poor. Where the rich were being exalted while the poor, they were being dishonoured. And James says it plainly, favoritism is a sin. Favoritism is a sin. And not only that, favoritism is wrong because it usurps God's power. It usurps God's sovereignty because favoritism puts man in the place of God as judge. You are judging another person. In verse 4 of James chapter 2, he says, Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? He did not mince his words. Huh? He puts it very bluntly, you know. If you practice favoritism, you are plainly evil. You are entertaining evil thoughts. And James points out the irony. He tells the recipients of his letter that it is actually the rich. You, you honour the rich, you give them the best seat in the house, but it is actually the rich who exploit the believers. It is actually the rich who drag you to court. And it is actually the rich who have blasphemed the name of God, verse 6 and verse 7. And so James takes great pain to say, true faith does not discriminate. True faith does not play favoritism. True faith practices biblical love. Verse 8, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. What is God's royal law? Love your neighbor as yourself. Actually, there are only two things that we need to follow. Love God wholeheartedly and love our neighbor as ourselves. If we can follow these two commands, we will be living a life that will bring God glory. We will be living a life that will be a powerful testimony for God and we will be able to bring many into the kingdom of God. God's royal law is love. And James says, favoritism, discrimination, violates the royal law. But then he says something more seriously. He says, violating God's law on any level uh, is a serious matter. On any level, it is a serious matter. Verse 10, he says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point. You keep the whole law, you stumble at one point, this tiny point. James says, you are guilty of breaking all of the law. You only need to break the law at one point 
to be guilty of breaking the whole law, of being branded by God as a lawbreaker. You can be a good person in every other way. You can be a good father, a good husband, a good worker in your office. But if you show favoritism, God says you are a lawbreaker because you have violated the royal law of love. And then he says in verse 12, don't practice favoritism. Instead, you are to speak and you are to act as those who are going to be judged by the law. What he's saying is this, live in the light of the fact that we will one day be judged. We will all one day stand before the judge. And then he goes on to say, true faith proves itself by its works. You know, I've already read verse 14 just now. But do you know that this part of James, James 2 verse 14 to 26 is famous for its theological controversy. You know, we know what Paul teaches. Paul says we are saved by grace through faith apart from works, right? Saved by grace, true faith, apart from works, you cannot earn your salvation. And it would seem that what James is saying here in this passage of Scripture is that you must have faith plus works to be saved. And that great reformist Martin Luther was said that he was so vexed, he was so angry, he was so angered by the whole epistle of James that he famously described the epistle of James as an epistle of straw. Compared to the other epistles, for it has nothing of the nature of the gospel, gospel about it. You know what? It was said, I don't know whether true or not. He described it as an epistle of straw because in the whole epistle of James, there's only one mention of the name of Jesus Christ. One time only. And it was said that he wanted this book to be thrown out of the Bible. Not true, la, not true. But he didn't want this epistle to be taught in the school where he was in. But I want us to really get this. James is not disputing the truth that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. He's not disputing that. Salvation, according to him, is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. At the heart of the dispute is not how you are saved. He's not talking about how you are saved. The question he is addressing is this. What is true faith? What is genuine saving faith? And to prove that he believes that you are saved by grace alone, in James 1 verse 18, he says, He, God, chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be, kind, we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Now, these words of James tells us that he's saying that new birth has nothing to do with us. It is a gift of God. It comes to us by the exercise of God's will. So he's not dealing with how you are saved. You're not saved by works. You're saved by grace alone, through your faith, in Christ alone, not in your works. But what he's saying is this. If you say you have faith, if you say that your faith is genuine, prove it now. And there's only one proof. Good works. True faith bears the fruits of faith. Faith that is merely a profession of faith and that does not result 
in a life of good deeds, James seems to be suggesting is not true faith. And then he says, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. What he's saying is that if you have genuine saving faith, it's not enough to talk. You need to show it. And then in chapter 3, we come to that very interesting part of the body. Yeah? In verse 1, he made a reference to the problem of the tongue. James says, true faith controls the tongue. Are you able to control your tongue? I need to ask my wife, am I able to control my tongue? I generally lose control of my tongue when I'm driving. Well, I don't know why. James says in James 1.26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. And their religion is worthless. If you say you are a believer, if you say you are a Christian, you cannot control your tongue. You deceive yourself. And James says this very serious, he makes this very serious statement, your religion is worthless. And he's pointing out to this contradiction between what you say you believe and how you your inability to control your tongue in verse 9 and 10 James says with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness out of the same mouth come praising and cursing my brothers and sisters this should not be this should not be and so what does James say and this is sobering. We will be held accountable for what we say. We will be held accountable for what we say. And I say this, I keep on thinking of all the stupid words that I've said in the last few days. Hurtful words, careless words, Words that tear down instead of build up. James says, be careful of your tongue. And he describes the tongue as this, small but mighty. Chili padi, small but got kicked. And he says, you must recognize its power for good and evil. That's why it's important to control it. That it does not become an instrument for evil, but for good. And this is how he describes the tongue. He says, it is a fire. It is a fire. Yesterday, Fawn was showing me this video clip that somebody sent her. Burn firecrackers and uh, ended up burning down <laughs> the awning of the house and a few cars. The tongue is a fire. Kecil kecil kawan bila besar jadi lawan. That's what the Malay say. The tongue is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. Oh, you look at the parts of your body, the foot. Oh, not not a world of evil, but you look at your tongue. It's a world of evil. And James says, it corrupts the body. It is humanly untamable. Only God can tame it.
we need to ask God for help. In fact, to live this kind of life, godly life, cannot be lived using our willpower, our determination. We need the Holy Spirit. And James says, if you are never at fault in what you say, then you are perfect. Because you are able to keep the whole body in check. You know, the tongue can keep the whole body in check. That's what he says. He compares it to the rudder of a ship. You can control the course of your life by controlling your tongue. And then he moves on to say, true faith acts with gentle wisdom. He asked this question, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it. We have that word again. Show it. Let them show it. By their good life, by deeds done in humility, in the humility that comes from wisdom. And what does this good life mean? look like today you ask people what is the good life they say oh, gated bungalow la, bmw don't know what series you know but this is not the good life he's talking about in verse 17 he says this is what the good life is about the good life that comes from the humility from deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom And this wisdom comes from heaven. What is this good life? What does it look like? It's a life of purity. It is pure. And then it is peaceable. Or in other translation, it is peace-loving. You can live with people, get along with people, even your enemies. Peace loving. You do not start quarrels. You know, as I say this, uh, I'm reminded of this football player. I don't know if, one way you know him, Dennis Wise. Uh, Dennis Wise. Uh, it was said that uh, he could start a quarrel by being alone in a room, you know. Being alone, he can start a quarrel, you know. A quarrelsome person. Consider it. Or gentle here. Willing to yield. Or submissive. Full of mercy. And good fruits. Without partiality. And without hypocrisy. So you've got, you say you've got true faith? Show it by your good life. Show it by a life that is marked by all this purity, love for mercy, good fruit, submissiveness, impartiality. Then you can say that you have true faith. And then in chapter 4, James addresses the problems of quarrel, the problem of quarrels and conflicts. He says, true faith practices humility in relationships. Quarrels will happen, misunderstandings will happen, conflicts will happen, simply because we are all sinners, we are all not perfect. Simply because, you know, there are, you know, we we are generally, because of our sin nature, we are selfish people. And so quarrels and conflicts happen. But how do you resolve this? By practicing humility. James says, uh, first, you judge yourself. In conflicts, you judge yourself. He speaks of the battle that rages within you. Oh, I'm, come on, no. I want to fight back. I'm not going to yield. He says, judge yourself. Judge the battles the tug of war happening in you, the black dog and the white dog. Don't feed the black dog because the black dog will always want to bite back. 
And then he says something interesting. Do not be a friend of the world, but be a friend of God. The world tells you, uh, don't just get angry, get even. James says, choose to be a friend of God, not a friend of the world, and humbly seek His grace. And then, the very famous verse, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. And what will the devil do? Run away from you. And finally, he says, draw near to God in humility. Then he addresses the subject of presumptuousness and boasting. He says, true faith practices humility in regard to the future. He's saying, don't think, uh, don't make plans without God. Don't say, I will do this tomorrow, I will do this next year, you know, these are all my plans. James says, instead, you ought to say this, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that, inshallah. And he gives this sober reminder. You know, life is frail, life is short, and he says this to us, you are a mist. Another version says you are a vapor. You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And so the point is this, he's saying life is frail. Life is short. Death is certain. And so because of this, James says, be warned. Don't be presumptuous. Don't boast about tomorrow. Do not make plans as if you are in control of the future. As if you are God, you are sovereign. You are in control. Recognize that only God is sovereign and submit to his sovereignty. Submit to him. And then he talks about the issue of responding to people who have wronged us, who have hurt us. James 5, 9, I the true faith practices humility by waiting for God to judge the wicked who have wronged us. Verse 9, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. I should read verse 8 also. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. So James is saying when you are wronged, wait patiently on the Lord. Don't take matters into your own hands. Wait for God. And the thing is this, when you are wrong, God is also dealing with you. God is wanting to use that to refine, mold and shape us. So James says, wait patiently on the Lord to deal with the wrongdoer. What you need to do is this. You need to stand firm. You need to strengthen your heart. Strengthen your faith so that you will be able to stand and not fall during such times. And then he says, uh, avoid sinning by grumbling. Don't go and say, you know this person did this to me, that person did this to me. You know, how unfair. Avoid grumbling. And why? Because he says, or oh, you too will be judged. You too will be judged. James 5.12 True faith practices humility by speaking the truth apart from self 
serving oaths. James says, above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth, by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no, otherwise you will be condemned. Whoa. Very strong. Huh? Be truthful in your communication. That's what he says. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Good enough. Let your word be your bond. Don't say, I swear by the moon and the stars in the sky, I'll be there. While the Bible does not say you cannot make oaths, the Bible does not encourage it. And the warning is this, if you practice deceptive speech, and you make false oaths, it will result in condemnation. Very, very serious. I mentioned just now that, you know, uh, it was said that the knees of James were hard as a camel's because he spent time on his knees praying all the time. So it's not surpri surprising that he talks about how important it is to depend on God through prayer. I'm not going to read through uh, these two verses in the interest of time, but he's basically saying prayer is very, very important. And he's saying that the prayer of faith and praying for one another is so important for healing and for the forgiveness of sin. And here he not only talks about praying, he talks about confessing your sin to one another. Oh, that's frightening. Huh? Confessing your sin to one another. Mutually. It is difficult to do that. Very awkward. Huh? How can you tell people your sin? That's the fear that this person might not like you anymore. After he's discovered the skeletons in your closet. But he's saying, when you confess your sins to one another, it will be healing to your spiritual life. And not only to you, the whole community of faith will be healthy as well because there's a culture of accountability. And then he ends with the motivation to pray. Why we must pray? Because he says prayer is powerful, prayer is effective. And he uses the example of Elijah. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. So the focus is not on our praying. The focus is not on us. The focus is on God. The prayer of the righteous is as powerful as the God to whom we pray. It's all about God. But we must pray. We must pray. And in the last two verses, you know, he says, you know, uh, backsliding is a common problem. People turn away. People stray from the truth. But he says this, true faith practices biblical love by seeking to restore those who have strayed from the truth. He says, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. It would seem that James is saying, you know, I'm commissioning you to the ministry of rescuing people. Rescuing people who once followed Jesus, 
who once had a love relationship with Jesus, but that love has already grown cold. You need to save them. You need to turn them. You need to turn their hearts back to God. And he's saying it's very important because if you are able to do so, you will save their souls from death. Now, does it mean that you can lose your salvation? I leave it to the person preaching this message to deal with this, okay? Chinese New Year. <laughs> Don't say bad things. Huh? But the truth is, this is an eternal consequence. You are able to save those you have turned their hearts around from death and cover over a multitude of their sins. I'm coming to the end. You know, uh, I think two weeks ago after uh, Pastor Winnie's message, as uh, Pastor Elvin came up to, to close the service, he mentioned this, and Asha made mention of this during our cell group meeting. I, I don't remember exactly what Pastor Elvin said, but he said something like this. Our greatest gift to God is not what we can do for Him. But becoming like Him. But becoming like Christ. I want to urge all of us that you know this is not just another preaching series where we gain information but we make it our goal this year that we want to grow in Christ likeness to attain to the wholeness of the fullness of the measure to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ you know i believe that as we study the epistle of james it is a serious thing because we are called to examine our faith. What is the quality of your faith? Is your faith genuine faith? Or is your faith mainly uh, made up of rhetoric? You know, after a few years, uh, you can talk like a Christian, you know. Instead of saying good morning, you say blessed morning. You say shalom. You can talk like a Christian. But are you a Christian? I want to read James 1, 22 to 25. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Nike says, just do it. James says, just live it. James says, just live it. And so as we go through these five chapters, 108 verses, let's pay attention to the 54 verses that contain imperatives. Let us honestly examine our lives in the light of God's Word. James says, Scripture is like a mirror. When you study Scripture, you look, you're looking into a divine mirror that allows you to see yourself as you really are, not what you think you are, not what you hope for people to think you are, but you see yourselves as God sees you, your true self. And James says you must be honest about what you see. Don't just look and then turn away and walk away because you will forget. You will forget the kind of person that God has shown you to be. My father-in-law has been telling me, oh, we must go for regular blood tests and medical examination. It's very good for you. It is very good 
to go for a regular spiritual examination. Keeps us healthy. And James says, you must obey what God teaches you. You must be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because he says, the blessing is only yours if you do. You know, but I want to say this as I was, you know, as Christine was leading worship and they were singing the song, Good, Good Father. I felt the Lord saying, you know, it's not about doing. Don't tell the people you must do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. It's not about it. Then you don't enjoy it. As if God is like a drill sergeant. Kiri kanan, kiri kanan, kiri kanan, you know. He's not. He's the good, good father. Why do we need to change? Because he wants us to be like him. I tell you, there's very little that delights me more than when I ask my son, Josiah, who do you look like, uh, mommy or me? If he says, I look like you, daddy, oh, I'm very shocked. <laughs> and I will not forget to remind my wife. Huh? But of course, this one will always say, I look like mommy. How can you know, you're my son? <laughs> but that's the delight of the Father. God wants you to look like Him. God wants you to just be like Him in every way. And that's the goal of becoming, you know? And that's the power, the joy of being in a relationship with God. So as you go through James, learn the lessons from your Heavenly Father as He teaches you, gently but firmly, that you need, you need to bear the fruits of your faith. Amen? Amen. Okay. I'm going to ask the worship team. I think... I know it's uh, 10 past 12. Uh, we're going to sing the song again, uh, Good, Good Father. I think the second verse uh, has this line that says, as you draw us deeper, deeper, deeper into love. You know, the Word of God, if used legalistically, will bring death. If used in a way the Pharisees had used the laws of God, it will not bring about a love relationship with God. So let us learn from our good, good Father who loves us unconditionally, who loves us supremely, who wants nothing better than the very best for us that we might have life and life to the full, that we might take on His very nature, that we might share in His holiness, that we might reap a harvest of peace and righteousness. I pass the time to Christine.
Thank you, Lord, that you are a Father who loves us. Thank you, O Lord, that uh, your love is uh, unchangeable, O Lord. Even though, Lord, we have uh, messed up so many times, Lord, yet your love for us has never lessened or diminished, O Lord. Thank you, O Lord, that you are a good, good Father. I pray, O Lord, that we will be able to understand, O Lord, your heart, even as you deal with us, O Lord. The God that we will understand that you just want to change us and transform us and renew us so that we might, O Lord, be changed from glory to glory, reflecting, O Lord, your holiness, reflecting, O Lord, your character. Help us, O Lord, I pray. I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all and in all. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord turn His face toward you and make His face shine upon you. The Lord turn His face toward you and grant you peace. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful week ahead.